Hi, my name is Mickey Meng. I'm the Assistant Director of the Wattis Institute in San Francisco, and I'm here to introduce Juan Gaetan, who is the eighth Berlin Biennial Curator. He's based out of Mexico City in Berlin. And also Franklin Sermons, who's the uh, Prospect Three Biennial Curator out of New Orleans. And he is the Curator for Contemporary Art at the LACMA in Los Angeles. So, Juan, do you want to t uh, start and talk about uh, a little bit about the Eighth Berlin Biennial? Okay. Can everybody hear us well? Can you hear Speak louder? I can't, but they can. Can we talk? I don't know if... Anyway, um, I was invited earlier, like um, a month ago, to to speak here about the Berlin Biennale, which I've been appointed in September to curate. And it will open in 2014, in the spring of 2014. Um, and I was asked to come up with a situation here on stage. And I knew that Franklin was more or less with the same timeline curating the prospect in New Orleans, so I asked Franklin if he was willing to have an on-stage, let's say, um, thinking session, <laughs> because we're both, uh, at the very beginning of our project, we both are still in the process of form formulating our ideas, putting together a team, um, and I didn't feel I could really uh, fulfill your patience by myself for a whole hour, given that I don't really have a full project yet formed. So Franklin gracefully accepted. So what, what we're going to do is basically um, have, I think my voice is going in and out, I am not sure, uh, have an onstage dialogue let, between New Orleans and Berlin, two cities that are completely different from each other, and discuss what it means to engage from the point of view of a biennial as a curatorial pl platform with a specific place, with its specific history and, and social and uh, political and cultural realities. Is that more or less <laughs> <that's> <laughs> accurate? <laughs> so um, what, uh, we, have, we have a very well structured uh, presentation. And uh, Franklin will speak first about Prospect, I think, yes. in the order of the, which Mickey Mank put us. And then I will say a few words. Then I'll say a few words about Berlin. So Franklin, okay, um, word right to you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you all for coming, and just uh, and thank you for inviting me for this discussion. And then, I guess the two of us in thinking that, okay, first you said an hour might not, you know, you might not be able to fill an hour by yourself. And so then it was the two of us, and we said, okay, we might not be able to fill an hour by ourselves. So <laughs> we're out of me. <laughs> we, were, we were fortunate to both know Mickey, and, and you guys are working together, and we had just worked together. So it seemed perfect. And if anybody had some sort of idea of what it is that we're thinking at this early stage, as you mentioned, it would be Mickey. Um, so I, I just also have been thinking about... Um, the idea of, of curating in context and thinking about um, here at Miami. So just it's, it's interesting to acknowledge, especially I think after a conversation that just happened um, between Mark uh, Glimcher and Josh Bayer, where they're talking about, I think it was called Art in Empires? The Age of Empires. Age of Empires. And it's, you know, it, it's so much a conversation reflective of everything that we're surrounded by out there. So. I thank um, our Basel and everybody, Claudio Vaught and uh, Mark Spiegler and everybody associated with it for doing these kind of conversations and adding another sort of element to um, what is more or less a commercial experience. Um, and we have to think about it in that context because I'm also thinking of, you know, it occurred to me, well, you have this opportunity, this platform, to talk about something that you're working on far in the distance. Um, but at the same time, we are formulating these kinds of ideas. And it's interesting to, to think about them in person, because I guess in some ways we talked about potentially you know, not wanting to talk about so much specifics, 
but about ideas in general and um, just acknowledging that as a, a sort of space where you don't have to define yourself, you don't have to define exactly what is happening, but the emphasis really is on the process. That said, I will just try and run through some images. I think I have um, a lot of images in here, but try and run through some of these past images that accompanied the first two prospects. And I can say that um, I started thinking about the exhibition, it's almost been a year now actually, because I was fortunate in, in talking to the founding director, Dan Cameron, who also lives and works in Los Angeles. We've been meeting periodically and sort of talking about the show. Um, Prospect began in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, which happened in 2005, and Dan Cameron has talked about subsequently thinking about how to use art and to think about the biennial project for New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. So he talked to, to me about going down there in January of 2006, you know, pretty soon after the hurricane, and um, thinking about this project in many ways similar to how we talk about biennials over time. Uh, if you think of perhaps the, like Guangzhou, which was begun in the early 90s or late 80s, um, after uh, a time of unrest in Korea and was created as a way of talking about some of these issues that were happening in the political sphere. Um, for me, what rings uh, even closer is uh, the history around Johannesburg and thinking about a biennial that began there in 1995, very much in reaction to the process and ending of apartheid and release of Nelson Mandela. Um, so again, this, this idea of a sort of traumatic experience. Um, and that is just sort of the background, I think, that he was thinking about in doing the first exhibition. The first prospect happened in 2008, and 2000, fall of 2008, and into the beginning of 2009, and had about 90-something uh, artists in 25 venues, I believe it was, and was uh, very much embraced the idea of a sprawling citywide exhibition that would incorporate different parts of the city. Uh, the second one happened in 2011 and only ended at the beginning of, of this past year. Uh, so it's a very fresh exhibition. I mean, one of the things we've talked about a little bit is, you know, working from this standpoint, the prospect is only its third incarnation uh, and thinking about Berlin as, as eighth year working on, I believe. Um, so it's very much a, a young biennial. And I am the first person who is working on the exhibition who wasn't the founding director who did the first two. So it also is a way of stepping outside of itself in some ways. Um, as, as mentioned, I am working at Los Angeles County Museum of Art and have you know, a, a team there that is also integral to the process of working on the exhibition. And Christine Kim is a colleague, associate curator at the museum and in, in the contemporary department who also did the art public projects here uh, at Art Basel in Collins Park, uh, and also Rita Gonzalez. And so in the process of, of working with each other in the department on a daily basis and thinking about artists and thinking about shows, it seemed like a sort of natural extension. Uh, fortunately, our director has been very supportive of us doing projects outside the museum as well as inside. Uh, so it seemed like a, a, a really easy way to work together. So um, can I'll show some images now too. Yeah. Of, uh... So but that first image you saw is probably one of the ones that is most identified with Prospect One. That was an uh, image, and you see the same piece here by Mark Bradford, who created, I mean, you see a what is in a way an arc, and there were, I think several projects in that first exhibition that dealt very specifically with the after effects of Katrina and being so close to that time period, it played such an important role. I think what you see now, what is in the process uh, for us is, is a sort of getting away from that sort of specificity and working on the level of, um, of a more international context that is related 
specifically to the city, but not necessarily to that direct experience. So this the, the Mark Bradford arc, and I show Leandro Ehrlich, um, another work that worked very specifically with uh, the situation there. And the, um, it's another piece like Bradford's work that was in a part of the city called the Lower Ninth Ward, which was probably the hardest hit by Hurricane Katrina in terms of the after effects. Uh, so it was very important to use, I think, that space as a very specific site in which to, to talk about those issues. Uh, another piece here from the Lower Ninth, this is Nari Ward, uh, uh, a big cube sort of sculpture that he did in a uh, church that had been severely damaged by the storm. Uh, so a lot of the projects were also about putting a spotlight and putting resources on specific places. After Nari left this uh, sculptural project, the church was built up again, and, and a lot of that was because of the emphasis of the biennial. Uh, Alex Arachea, and another piece that relates somewhat to um, water in this case, and this is a drawing of a piece that he also did in sculptural form in front of uh, the Harris Casino in New Orleans. So you have the next one. So you see it there. Um, the idea, I guess, of music, of performance, of vernacular culture is something, go back one, sorry is something that I've thought about a lot in other contexts and obviously would play a, a pretty strong role in a place like New Orleans. And this is an installation by Victor Harris. And he is using you know, this, this form of culture that is very much about a level of dynamism and performance, uh, but then putting them into the space of the museum context. There is a small gallery slash museum called Bat Street Museum in the Treme neighborhood where you can see these suits that are worn during Mardi Gras and worn during the carnival, uh, but then to put them in this other context, I think was something quite interesting and something that we're thinking about a lot for Prospect 3. Um, another work by God Amir, which is also in the Lower Ninth. You can go a little bit faster enough. Um, Sanford Biggers, uh, another sort of iconic work that was done in the U.S. Mint uh, in New Orleans, where you had this, this piano twisted around this tree, the piece is called Strange Fruit. So again, thinking about a very specific sort of history um, and not only thinking about the, the, the local of New Orleans, but something that we also are trying to emphasize is this idea of ten, sort of tangential circles coming out from New Orleans. So thinking about the South very specifically, something that Sanford was looking at. This piece here, it's hard to make out the images in those uh, drawings, but it's a work by McCallum and Terry, Brad McCallum and Jackie Terry, in which they were redoing the uh, portraits of people who had been arrested in the Civil Rights era. So you have that very sort of specific history um, at play. And you can zoom through now. Um, music, prevalence of music, again, this is a work from the second biennial by Luc Dubois in which he had four different high school marching bands all begin in different parts of the city and then converge on this uh, same park. So they all met up at exactly the same time and just really playing with that, that sort of musical history that is so important to New Orleans. Um, another piece in the New Orleans Museum of Art. So using different structures and thinking about different kinds of architectural spaces from the very institutionalized, you know, the older sort of space uh, for looking at art in New Orleans, which is the New Orleans Museum of Art, to those other projects that you saw in very different kinds of spaces. This is a place called Longview House and Garden. It gives you an idea of, of some of those different spaces, those more um, non-traditional uh, spaces for looking at art. And the New Orleans African American Museum. This is the Contemporary Art Center in New Orleans. <clears throat> and Tulane, the Newcomb Gallery at Tulane University. So we're also working with a lot of academic institutions at the same time. Again, New Orleans Museum of Art. And the Ogden Museum for Southern Art, um, which reminds me of, of, again, of that idea with the Victor Harris piece of a certain level of vernacular culture and wanting to talk about how important that is within the sphere of what exactly is art in New Orleans. I think for a lot of people that I've encountered in the process thus far, 
If it doesn't involve music, food, or dance, then it's not really art. So working with a more two-dimensional or more traditional kind of thing that we talk about here is, is part of the challenge in that space. Uh, another university gallery, University of New Orleans, and Dillard University, uh, historically black college and university there in New Orleans. And now I think Juan, okay. this is your... Okay, well, um, in a way it's interesting uh, how you put the... You lay out this brief history of the of prospect because the way I approach this Berlin Biennale is uh, also as a sort of ongoing project that gets uh, revised or revisited every two years. So in a, in a sense, I see my role as as one of the uh, a team of curators spread through time trying to perfect this uh, thing called the Berlin Biennale. And for those of you who don't really know uh, the whole history of the Berlin Biennale, I can say a, a, a brief thing about how it began. Um, to, to simplify it somewhat, the, it began out of two events. One is uh, the, this sort of the, the reality in Berlin after the war, where this, this area of the city that they refer to as Mitte is, was uh, formerly part of the East, and it was dilapidated, lots of empty space uh, lying around, and uh, a, a really a strong desire uh, from the from the government, actually, to fill them up as quickly as possible. So if you go to Berlin, you see very massive architecture all around, uh, monuments that were, in my opinion, partly uh, response to, to the panic that they felt when they saw so many empty lots lying around the city. And these, the city sort of split between east and west, still uh, demogra demographically, geographically, uh, topographically. And uh, this was one of the most available areas in the city. And um, as we were putting together, uh, well, the, the other event was that many, because it was such a cheap uh, place to live, uh, many artists from all over Europe and the world were moving to Berlin. So the first one was mostly uh, uh, um, a biennial of artists living and working in Berlin. And from the second on, it became more of an international project like it is now. And as we were looking for images for this brief presentation, uh, Mickey came across this, which is not at all what you find today. It's the, the facade of the building is the same, but I was surprised to see this building in a context that I, I didn't even remember. Uh, but it was not, it's not such an old picture. Now, when you see it from this angle, on the on your right, also on my right, uh, there is a huge building that was built by a private collector, and I, if I'm not mistaken, behind there's also uh, uh, something blocking this beautiful blue sky. So it's kind of compressed now between two. But it also indicates that not so long ago there was still this reality of this part, part of town with all these empty lots lying around and many biennials, uh, many of the versions of the biennial, especially the fifth one, engaged with this issue. Now, we don't, I don't have a more recent picture to illustrate this, but now this is not at all what you find in this area of the city. And um, usually it's not this sunny either in Berlin. But <laughs> the, the, so the part of my, in, in a sense, my challenge to, for this project has two fronts. One is to recognize that, um, like Prospect, the Berlin Biennale has used available spaces throughout Berlin and made uh, an effort to find interesting um, empty buildings and lots. And, but this is not so easy anymore because now there's a, a development bubble, a real estate bubble in the city. and and there is lots of restaurants and bars that were not there before. Um, and this, especially this part of the city, is very international. You hear mostly English uh, spoken on the streets, which is not at all what happened before. So one thing is to try to search for another geography of Berlin that is not based in here. Although the Kunstwerke, which is the center that you're looking at, and it's also the Biennial has always been 
produced from the Kunzwerke, they're two parallel projects, they're interrelated, and the director of both is sitting here, Gabi Horn. Uh, the, the, the Berlin Biennale always uses the Kunzwerke because it's available and it's there, but you find other places around town, and this is the first stage that we've actually been doing for the, last, for the past weeks, driving around Berlin, looking for empty space, which is not there. The other one is to um, <coughs> move away from this history of the 20th century and move into other historical realities of the city, perhaps even realities that are prior to the 20th century, because I have the sense that there is um, material there that artists who are not European can relate to effectively more strongly than to these issues that are specific to the Weimar Republic and to the Berlin Wall, which are very strong uh, ideological components of this city. Um, I, and so I want to show you one of the first projects that was sent to me a few weeks ago. This is the inside of the Kunstwerke with the Dan Graham Pavilion on the left, which is the Café, Café Bravo. And uh, the Kunstwerke, the exhibition spaces in the back, all those floors in the back, and the offices are, and uh, apartments and studios are the, the two, are on the, in the two buildings that are flanking it. Um, this is a project that was sent to me a few days ago by an architect from Greece called Andreas Angelidakis. Um, he, he's sort of operating between art and architecture, but mostly as an architect. And I, I told him that I wanted him to produce a new space or a new design for an existing space that is adjacent to the offices of the Biennale which is uh, an empty room with chairs and, and tables where people meet and where they also have dinners for the Kunstwerke and the Biennale. And uh, most of the time it just sits there, there are also screenings. But I thought it was a bit too clinical and I would like to see something a little bit warmer where you can have uh, gatherings with the artists who are in town, with people who are in town and receive people, host people, etc., and also work. So I said to him, I just sent him a line. I said, could you produce a gift from the Greeks to the Germans? And he uh, came up with this, which is quite amazing, because I was already thinking of the 19th century, and he found these images. And what this image shows is the um, enlightened Greeks who were educated in Germany in the late 19th century with the locals who were basically living and working in Greece. The, the enlightened ones were already starting to imagine Greece as part of Europe, whereas the rest still felt be that they belonged to the Ottoman Empire or to the former Ottoman Empire. And they came in the typical you know, revolutionary way. They, they rallied, they got these people together, and they pro produced a revolution. They got their independence. They started their state, mostly or exclusively run by the Greeks who were educated in Europe, excluding all the others. So the first uh, prime minister or the, the first president of Greece was killed by these people because they felt they had been left out of governmental representation. And, um, and so you, we can go to the next image. So um, what Angelidakis found out was that the, the uh, IMF was founded originally by, Gre by Germany and France to monitor the Greek debt back then. So it's kind of this full circle to what's going on right now. And he also f has been finding in these flea markets all these rugs that were made in the 19th century, early 20th century, sold for five or 10 euro. So he's been collecting these. Uh, for this project, and these are, this is a flea market. Sometimes they are families that want to just sell stuff for money. Sometimes they are houses that are uh, abandoned, and then people go and take whatever they want to take and take it to the flea market. So then, and we move to the next image. So then he's constructed this space, 
or design, is designing this space where these rugs, and some of them have the dates there, 1896 or something like this, will be kind of covering these blocks and you can sort of sit in different altitudes and it's conceived as a sort of ruin in a way, but also a ruin that you're kind of occupying and hosting people in. The, where it says poster, there will be a poster that is not designed yet. <laughs> that Andreas is in the process of designing. And these are renderings that his studio has produced for the, for the space. And uh, maybe I think there's a sort of area view of a scale model. I think that's the last um, of it. Is it not that's, there? Yeah, that was the last of the images. And we took it out? <laughs> but it was there before. Well, it's not, it's not there anymore. I apologize. Anyway, so you don't get the scale model. Anyway, so you see that what was interesting is that we were having dinner in Berlin a few, uh, a couple of weeks ago. He came to look at the space, but he already had this thing in mind. And I'm sitting there, and he's like, so Juan, what are you thinking? And I'm like telling him, oh, you know, the 19th century is interesting to me because there were all these travelers in the 19th century. They produced visual information in uh, Latin America, for example, through botanical expeditions, et cetera, et cetera. And this is still visual material that contemporary artists refer to. In, in those places. And I'm interested in this engagement with his the point of view of contemporary art and um, explaining to him, you know, Humboldt went to Latin America. There is also, you know, the traveling of forms through imperial networks, etc. And he says, oh, that's funny, because he communicates like this. That's funny. And well, why is that funny? Because, and then he told me this project. But we had never talked about the 19th century. So it was kind of like this amazing, um, uh, you know, uh, serendipity, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. that we were somehow confirmed. It's, it's great as a curator when artists confirm your suspicions. <laughs> anyway, confirmed that I, we had to move away from a certain historical framework in Berlin and try to readjust it in order to allow other histories to sort of emerge through this project. So this is kind of like um, an amuse bush of what's to come in Berlin and in Prospect uh, as well. And um, we're also planning to exchange roles halfway down. So he will be the curator of the Berlin Biennale and I will be the curator of Prospect. That would be perfect. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if there are any questions. Or if Do we have, time, we have time for one question, if anybody in the audience has one? For the yeah. second question. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I just was curious about these, um, you were talking about having biennales and sites of trauma and knowing that citizens there have, have probably more recently experienced trauma. So just, especially in New Orleans with such recent trauma. So I guess how is the art architecture, how is the biennale interacting with the citizens that are there? and what's been successful and what hasn't. And I guess that goes for Berlin as well, maybe a few years ago. <clears throat> well, it's hard for me to think about the, the one that I'll be working on as far as what works and what doesn't work, but I'd say that, I mean, one of the things that has happened because of, is because of the experience of having the biennial there, there are all of the sort of after effects of of what art does in some ways in those situations. In, and I mean that in a way similar to the fact that I, th I believe uh, since Art Basel has been here in Miami, there is a after effect economically on the city simply because of that and the influx of people who are cultural tourists in some ways and, and also buyers. Um, so there, there has been that effect. There is a much greater emphasis and spotlight on what is happening on artists in New Orleans at this point. There are, I, I think one of the things that I, I think is interesting in comparison is that there is an incredible artist-run gallery scene there where you have artists who are, are really presenting the work, making the work and presenting the work for each other. Um, in a really vibrant way that is not like a lot of other cities. So I think there are a lot of, of long-term benefits that have come 
out of it. Could they be better? Definitely. Um, it's hard to, for me to relate to the shortcomings, but of course they're there. Um, I think what I'd like to see come out of the exhibition is more of the sort of concrete evidence of the exhibition um, that helps or empowers people in their daily lives. And I believe that art does that. So if we leave more art there, and we leave a place where artists can work and exchange ideas in a better way, then we will be successful. I also think that there are a lot of after effects that could be really um, defined economically, and, and hopefully that's going to happen too. Do you want to take one more? Yeah, yeah. We were, we're yeah, kind of joking. One more. We can do one more question. Does anybody ask one? Okay. There's one question there. I, I just wonder, as curators, how do you go through the process of selecting the artists that you choose to be in the Biennale? I mean, you go to like a checklist or something that, you know, artists that they are, uh, they have a message that is related to what you're doing uh, curating these events? Um, it's not so strict <laughs> as you put it. Uh, there's no uh, method in a way. There's more like, um, I think after uh, several years of working as a curator and and uh, be, being uh, very c close to many of the artists that you've you've met, uh, the the art also informs much of your practice as a curator. And um, perhaps the first impulse, which is the only one I can actually. Uh, 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 speak for at the moment is to um, imagine the kinds of com collaborations that can emerge from these complicities that you have built with the artists through the years. So uh, let's say there is, uh, the, 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 we can put it as a sort of, there's the constants and the variables in your life and the, the, the constants are maybe these artists that you've worked with and met with and lived with for many years, with whom you think your project can uh, improve and intellectually and also in other ways uh, be stronger to, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, things move on a little bit more organically, I would say. I don't know if... Uh, yeah. yeah, I think there, there was a lot to be said for that. I think yeah, cohorts and, and artists or art that you feel like um, you have a really uh, strong sensibility for, and then taking it from there and sort of seeing how that fills out. For me, at this point, it's just, it's been, and it's a fun process of literally lists. On one hand, what really just strikes you or turns you on as far as uh, what's happening artistically right now, and then there is a certain point, which is beginning to happen for me now, where the, the, back, the background of the place and the history that you believe is represented there begins to play a greater and greater role. And there are some things that are going to jibe with that and really highlight and make explicit um, ideas that relate specifically to that place. And you can see artists who are going to relate to that place in a certain way and I think that is where I, I am at this point. So, you know, just literally looking at a list of like 500 artists and then bringing it down to 300 and then going down to 100. And, and that's sort of the fun part of the process. So I, I don't know, I think there is, to go back to, to that idea of a strict thing around lists, it does play sort of a role in the process. I mean, the list is a mnemonic device, if you can put it that way. So when you have all the artists' names in front of you, then they're always producing images in your head that you're like, it's more or less what Franklin was saying. We also, one of the things we wanted to discuss was this issue of responsibility when you have a platform like uh, Prospect or Berlin. And in my case, part of this responsibility includes having uh, an exhibition that is coherent. And you know, uh, 
And this also is a big factor in, in what artists are going to be, as Frank was saying the most, uh, you know, wh whose practices is, are, are like able to, to bring together this kind of issue that you want to raise in a way like, you know. Uh, I think the, the other interesting thing that we've t talked about a little bit is, is I mean, and it's, it can become cliche to have the conversation on biennials over time, but, but we are genuinely interested in exactly that and you know, what happened at the last Documenta versus what happened at Venice versus what happens in Istanbul. Yeah. And where do you choose to enter into that discussion is something that we have been Just thinking about <laughs> and talking about. <laughs> Along the same on. Along the same lines of the conversations that you may have in between fairs and these things, to what extent do you have to have an awareness of the intention of the conversation with also goes on with the commercial market itself? Because there's obviously realities of getting these things funded in these things, but how much is there a primacy of the ideas you're dealing with relative to what may be market undercurrents that affect the ideas people are working with as well? Well, here we are in totally different places because the Berlin Biennale has a, the, the total budget comes from the state. So one of the, the great things about the Berlin Biennale, and, or unique, let's put it, uh, is that you have a total autonomy within that budget to do what you want. You don't have any pressure from anyone. I mean, of course, there are always pressures, but this, this is like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a Biennale that stands out because it's perceived and it really is a space where you have uh, total autonomy as a curator to do it as, as you want, which also, of course, means that if things go wrong, it's your fault. <laughs> you know, but I think Franklin is in a, is in a uh, in, in, with respect to how it's, uh, the funding is structured, in, for, in the case of Franklin, if I'm not mistaken, it's a little bit more uh, of a puzzle work. And, um, yeah, well, it, it's similar to the way that, that museums began if we you know think about 19th century and what happened uh, in Germany and it being very much from the state as you say and then thinking about an American context and it being much more about an independent um, way of working and so there is that that sort of difference um, but I don't I think you know for us we are a part of it and part of that discussion because you have to get to a place where artists can work comfortably. And so part of that process for us has been to say, and I can say that we're working with around 50 to 60 artists in the end, and about a third of them will come to the city to make work that is either inspired directly by the city or even site-specific work. And I can say that we're inviting a lot of people down there in that process and inviting them to think and to propose. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And that's part of the process. So, you know, we're complicit and we're not. Do you have, do you have final decision on a, uh, the artist's work then that's put in? Like, do they get to just say, this is my idea and this gets in if you choose them? Or do you choose them and then work to the end and go, okay, now it's okay, and this will be approved. <laughs> I asked uh, all of them for a proposal, which means that uh, I'm, I'm hoping at any given time I can say, please propose something else, <laughs> but, but you, you, I don't know. I mean, maybe sometimes you don't really understand the proposal until later on, so, but yeah, I mean, in, uh, you, I would say it's more of a, there has to be a measure of confidence and trust in each other. And this is part of the relationship between artists and curators. If, if you have a good working relationship, you can, you can you know, uh, respond to the work more, more uh, let's say, uh, brutally. Because then they also trust that what you're saying is coming from an informed point of view and not merely capricious. Uh, 
uh, and uh, at the same time comes your way, right? Uh, so I would say it's in principle, yeah, but I think it's the same for you. Each project is hopefully <laughs> a fun negotiation and uh, every, both yeah. sides get exactly what they want. But I can't help but think of uh, something I've been thinking about in this process too is, you know, um, there are certain artists where they may have the upper hand in that negotiation. And I think sometimes it's good for us to get out of the way and just, okay, maybe you're unsure of it, but in the end, you have faith in the artist to sort of go forth. Um, I mean, Walter Hopps said, find the cave, hold the torch. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, a few, to, to, as a sort of more anecdotal response to your question, the, when I was uh, the younger as a curator, I invited Lawrence Wiener, but how do you edit a Lawrence Wiener proposal when you're a young curator? So he sent something that I read and I couldn't understand, and I said, sure, it sounds great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was <laughs> in the show. But you know, maybe it would have been different now. But back then, uh, it was. Would it be just, different? Yeah, probably. You know, you could say no, thank you. <laughs> but it was a good piece. I, I'm just saying that. Uh, I'm just trying to remember what it was to be like, uh, very, you know, impressed by the fact that Lawrence Wiener had accepted to be in the show, and I didn't feel I had the right to question what he was submitting. Yeah. You know, and uh, so anyway. This is more of an old anecdote than a, <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thank you all for coming. Thank Thanks you. Talk. Thank you.